Season four of the Missing Witches podcast is lovingly sponsored by our Patreon patrons. Thank you. We love you. And Foxglove Farm. We love you. Go to foxglovefarm.com and use offer code MISSINGWITCHES for 13% off your order. You aren't being a proper woman, therefore you must be a witch. You must be a witch. This episode honors a 7th century hero, a black indigenous woman who was a leader, a warrior priestess named Dia, champion of the native North African Amazi people. Her name means the beautiful gazelle in the Tamazite language of the Amazi. Amazi, plural Imazian, means free or noble people in the indigenous Tamazite language. Among outsiders, the more common name for Amazian is Berber which comes directly from the word barbarian or barbary. It is a colonizer's word, a word that's used to diminish, disappear, and destroy. Like her people, Dia is largely known to the world now by the name given to her by those she resisted, conquerors who wrote her history for generations and christened her El Kahina, or the Kahina, meaning prophetess, or seer, or witch. Arab records describe her as having dark skin, a mass of hair, and huge eyes. She was said to have supernatural powers, that she read the movements of desert birds and the messages sketched by the wind on the leaves and sand to predict the future. Whether or not she was a sorceress, I want to cast her story into our constellation of witches, and especially of black witches and indigenous witches, because you deserve a pantheon of queens to stand beside you. Let me acknowledge first that I'm going to wade way far out beyond histories and cultures and languages I know here, and I'm going to flounder and splash around, and hopefully I won't end up so far afield that you'll feel I fucked it up. And if you do know pieces of this story of Dia and her magic that I miss out on here, we hope you'll write to us at missingwitches at gmail so we can be lit up by your strands of insight and weave them in. Please consider Amy and me just as people willing to try. Settler descendants looking for the gaps and erasures. Looking, as artist and activist Marisa de la Peña told us in episode 53, to be unsettled. It is our job to unsettle our colonial thinking. We go looking with this feeling that there's history missing, and with the knowledge that the power and magic and healing and leadership of marginalized genders and races and cultures are a crucial part of finding new life in a world wrought by plague and violence, fascism and injustice. We have to dig through the slipping shale of many shady burials. Use the world-making power of our collective dreaming to see beyond the concrete and smoke-filled desert to where there used to be trees. Leap toward each other in the dark, with our masks on and two meters apart, of course, to figure out where our roots are and where our wings touch and what the fuck we're going to do now. I don't know or have a guess at the great big answer to that question of what to do now, but my small answer for today is to keep seeking and sharing missing stories. So please, join me as we reverently call into the circle we make here in the dark between our ears, Dia, the seer, the priestess, the leader, the queen, the witch. Dia was a religious and military leader who led indigenous resistance to the Arab Muslim conquest of the Maghreb, the region then known as Numidia. The greater indigenous land of the Amazian is called Tamazga, and it stretches across the borders, imaginary lines becoming real, that we now know today as Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, the Western Sahara, Mauritiana, the Canary Islands, and parts of Egypt, Mali, and Niger. This is a story about history and how it gets written on the land and on the people, the way stories, spells in their own right, claim and create what happens. Truth that becomes like a weapon. As beautiful oracle friend Amanda Yates Garcia reminds us in her book Initiated, it matters whose stories get told. It matters how we tell them. Imagination matters. In the utilitarian histories crafted by colonizers, the witch's real life goes missing, but the witch herself remains, and she still rings with power. Medieval historian Ibn Khaldun recorded many legends about Dia. They refer to her spectacular hair and great size and strength, all apparently characteristics of sorcerers as well as descriptors of powerful black women in those texts. 
One legend claims that in her youth she freed her people from a tyrant by agreeing to marry him and then murdering him on their wedding night. You gotta say, that's one way to deal with tyrants. Dia succeeded Kusela as the war leader of the Amazian tribes in the 680s and continued his opposition to the encroaching Arab Muslim armies of the Umayyad dynasty. The Amazian had lived through multiple waves of migration and colonization already. The Carthaginians, Romans, and the Byzantine empires had stretched their long arms across the land with acts of violence and destruction, also bringing new science and culture and ideas, some of which were inspiring to the Amazian they adapted freely for their own use. Jews had been deported from Jerusalem for resisting the Roman Empire, and many Amazian converted to Judaism in this period. Many Amazian also converted to Christianity in Numidia of the 4th century, but the overall pattern seems to be that a wave of another civilization would hit, and then in the face of weather, resistance, remoteness, terrain would slip back and lose hold, and the Amazi leaders would remain, bearing new tools and new scars, still tending to their people and their land. In the early 7th century, the Amazi of northwestern Africa were under the control of the Exarchate of Carthage, at that time a division of the Byzantine Empire. After Egypt fell to Islamic conquest, the Exarchate found itself in direct conflict with the Islamic Caliphates. Umayyad general Hassan ibn al-Numan led the Arab Islamic armies as they marched from Egypt and captured Carthage and other cities. When Carthage fell, it lifted the Byzantine control of the area. And with their former rulers defeated, Dia rallied the Amazian tribes under her leadership. Searching for another enemy to defeat, General Hassan was told that the most powerful monarch in North Africa was the, quote, Queen of the Berbers, Dia. And so he led his armies into Numidia, looking for a fight that would act as a symbol to all those who would resist the coming tide of Islamic civilization. In 698, the armies met near Meskiana in present-day Algeria. Dia defeated Hassan so soundly that he fled Afrikia and holed up in Cyrenaica, licking his wounds for years. Dia's life is mostly known to us through Arab historians writing on the Muslim conquest of Africa, and then later through French historians and novelists who use her story to justify their own colonial violence in Algeria. Some Arab historians claim she was a Jewish sorceress who descended from the Beta Israel community of Ethiopian Jews. She is said to have been a royal member of the Jarawa tribe within the larger confederacy known as the Zanata tribe, a princess who became queen and ruled over an autonomous state in the area of the Orez Mountains in modern-day northeastern Algeria. Some sources claim that Dia was a Christian and that she derived her power from a Christian icon she carried with her. But it's also been argued that she practiced the ancient indigenous religion of the Amazian, which centered around the veneration of the sun, moon, and ancestors. The stories of her prophetic powers are in keeping with Numidian ancient belief in which the gods or the spirits of the dead could communicate with members of the tribe who had the gift of prophecy. Pomponius Mela reported that they considered the spirits of their ancestors to be gods. After making requests, sending up their questions over to the strongest members of their family who stood along the other shore, they slept in their tombs to await responses in dreams. Herodotus wrote, They divine by visiting the sepulchral mounds of their ancestors and lying down to sleep upon them after having prayed. And whatsoever thing the man sees in his dream, this he accepts. And so a priestess, with the ears to hear and sight to see, might spend nights resting against the family burial mound, watching the stars, listening to the earth dream, listening in dreams to the long line of people who brought you here, and listening also to the stones themselves. And now, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> you all remember Fox Glove Farm from our last season. We are so stoked to be working with Sammy again and with Fox Glove Farm. Yeah, this this incredible witch in her kitchen makes just such beautiful product and and like inspiring things that I've actually used all the time that really touch my life. I use that like so moted I call it so moted B, the so moted T, so moted T. Um yeah, sorry, I'm just flumbering all over the place. <laughs> You use the Somoda tea. I use the Somoda tea all the time, and I use the other, the calming one too, the anxiety. 
they're beautiful. They're so, they're perfect for, for my workings at home. And she's just a pleasure and delight. So we really are excited to work with her again and excited for you guys to get an opportunity to discover her, her witchy boxes. Right. These subscription boxes, it's like a combination of things you can keep. Like, um, um my box had like a little incense plate mm. in it and, you know, artwork, stuff like that, but also things you can consume like soap and tea. Uh, Foxglove works with <clears throat> witchy artisans and puts their stuff into the boxes. It's all ethically sourced. Um, Sammy is one of the most ethically reliable people that I've ever come across. Yeah, in fact. she's doing her best. I mean, we're all doing our best, but she's she's really out there doing the work. And I mean, it's COVID times. Like, get yourself a witch present and use it to inspire your work in changing the world, you know? I was going to say the same thing. You know, we're all feeling a little bit lonely. And yes, we should not go shopping to, uh, <laughs> to uh, get rid of those lonely feelings. But the idea of belonging to something where every month you're going to get something that's just going to make you feel better and you don't have to worry about you know labor exploitation or any of the other things that come with a lot of deliveries yeah we like it we love her we hope you check it out and make uh, use of that sweet sweet listener offer code missy witches for 13 percent off your order and if you really um aren't into buying things but you have some extra money kicking around you can still support sammy by uh making a contribution to her wildlife rescue which she is building herself because of course once she had donated one of her kidneys to a stranger she figured time to start rescuing raccoons and squirrels <laughs> so once again you can support missing witches by supporting fox club farm and you can save 13 percent by using the offer code missing witches Augustine of Hippo claimed that the polytheistic North Africans worshipped the rocks. Indigenous people in North Africa erected huge monolithic stone monuments that tracked the summer solstice in Orion's belt. Archaeologists think that these sites brought people back together each year to a place in the desert where there once was a lake, though there isn't any more. And a recurring theme of this season, and of our lives, I guess, in this day of late stage capital is the desert that comes to eat the lakes and the trees. People would come to these ancient lakes and make offerings and share stories and honor their ancestors, family members, and trees and water. They built pyramid-shaped tombs and there is evidence they practiced embalming a thousand years before the earliest examples from their neighbors, the ancient Egyptians. Dia's gift of prophecy is said to have given her knowledge of how her opponents would form troops of how they would be reinforced and what direction they would come from. According to legend, during a battle when she was outnumbered by the Arab forces and fell back in retreat, she recognized the direction of the wind and ordered her army to set fires which the wind carried to the enemy. The Arab army was forced to retreat and the land was so badly burned that any future campaigns would have to cross an arid wasteland without resources. According to the Arab historians and legends, her victory by fire gave Kahina the idea to initiate a scorched earth policy on a larger scale. She is claimed to have believed that the coming army was only interested in the richness of the land, and so the smoking husk of earth left by her military ingenuity made her think that maybe, if she destroyed the farms and gardens of what had been the granary of the Roman Empire, then the next wave of hungry colonizers would leave her people alone. According to this version, she therefore commanded her army to tear down the fortifications, destroy the cities and towns, melt down all gold and silver. She ordered orchards cut, fields burned, and private gardens destroyed. Some historians claim that this scorched earth policy, which was designed to deprive the invading Muslims, led to a loss of support from her people, so in the end she stood alone. She allegedly engaged in this tactic to save her people, but for all those who lived in the towns and cities and relied on the fields and orchards, Dia's policy would have been disastrous. With their homes and businesses destroyed, the only option left would be a nomadic wandering in a place that had been destroyed by war even before Dia supposedly set it on fire. The Arab armies themselves repeatedly used the scorched earth tactic as they moved across the region. In Egypt, Libya, and Mesopotamia, the invading Arab army routinely practiced this complete destruction to subdue the population. This was a common wartime tactic at the time for colonizing armies, so maybe this destruction by fire wasn't Dia burning down her world out of fierce desperation, ready to give up everything her people had built to at least keep the rocks beneath their fate, a last-ditch effort to be free. Maybe instead it was just another act of colonizers.
and Arab writers attributed the destruction of the land to Dia, using history for propaganda to dissolve her radiant power, blaming the widespread destruction on the indigenous sorceress queen who led the resistance. Either way, after the scorching of the earth, many of Dia's former allies left her side, going over to Hassan because they were brokenhearted and demoralized by the loss of all they had built, their homes and gardens, and because they were susceptible to bribery when they had little else left. One of her sons either defected or was captured. Under who knows what kind of pressure he informed on his mother's battle plans. In the early 700s, Kahina again met Hassan in battle. Before the armies engaged, the story goes that she sent her two remaining sons to the enemy camp to be raised by Hassan as Muslim warriors. The story we have is that the battle went against Dia from the beginning. She was badly outnumbered and her children were gone. Accounts vary concerning her death. She may have been captured and later executed, or she may have poisoned herself, but the most commonly accepted story is that she died in battle with her troops still clutching her sword. Her head was cut off and brought to Hassan as a trophy. She was, according to Ibn Khaldun, 127 years old. Hassan respected Dia as an opponent, and her sons, who converted to Islam, were well cared for and would later lead their own armies against others who resisted Arab aggression. Dia's people, on the other hand, did not fare well. 30,000 to 60,000 were sold into slavery by the conquerors and shipped out of their native land. Many wives of Numidian chiefs killed themselves rather than be taken. Small pockets of resistance held out, but between 705 and 750, North Africa was fully conquered and the people converted to Islam. After being used as a cautionary tale for what might happen to resistors, Dia's story faded for a while into obscurity. Until that is, she was seized upon by the French in the 19th century to support their own military maneuvering in Algeria. She was cast as a freedom fighter who could inspire resistance to Arab Muslim rule. Amazian history tellers also reasserted their claim to her. She was and is their heroine, though Arab nationalists in the region somehow also managed to argue she was theirs. Cynthia Becker writes, Since the 9th century, accounts of Kahina have been adopted, transformed, and rewritten by various social and political groups in order to advance such diverse causes as Arab nationalism, Berber ethnic rights, Zionism, and feminism. Throughout history, Arabs, Berbers, Muslims, Jews, and French colonial writers, from the medieval historian Ibn Khaldun to the modern Algerian writer Kateb Yassin, rewrote the legend of the Kahina and in the process voiced their own vision of North Africa's history. The French and Amazi, Muslims and Jews, men and women alike, used her life and resistance to give themselves power. They used her in fiction and tilted histories to voice their own views, rewriting her history and the history of North Africa in the process. She became a conduit, a symbol, an icon, a tool. As Kahina scholar Majid Hanoum writes, the French colonial experience in Algeria effectively cut off Algeria from its history. So the Kahina, in being politicized by various Algerian inhabitants in both the native and colonial populations, was evidence of an attempt to create a history that was becoming harder and harder to retain. Today, Dia al-Kahina's image is used by Amazi activists to symbolize their own strength. Her face glimpses at you from graffiti and sculptures around Algeria, and she stands in for the progressive ideals of the modern resistance. Amazi activists fight against progressive Arabization and Islamization and call for women's rights and secularism as indigenous values. A story of Dia in Bagai was condemned by the government for blasphemy. Amazi activist Nunya Kahina writes, in parts of Tamazga, like the Canary Islands, which are occupied by Spain, and Kabylia, there are movements for independence or autonomy, attempting to actually reclaim Amazi land and gain self-determination. In both past and present, Amazian have fought for the freedom to practice our culture and speak our language on our own land. From 1921 to 1926, Rifi and Amazian rose up against Spanish colonialism and established a state of their own, the Republic of the Rif. This Amazi state was only destroyed by Spain's use of chemical weapons, targeting civilian populations. The Kel Temashek, indigenous to the Sahara, have risen up against the Malian and Nigerian governments in the quest for self-determination, which most recently culminated in the creation of the state of Azawad in early 2012. The secular Azawadian state, without outside support, fought against Islamist militants and was then invaded by French, Malian, and West African military forces. Other organizations are fighting for greater rights of Amazi people within current political systems. 
Diasporic Amazi organizations in Europe and North America have various goals, such as to revive Amazi culture and advocate for Amazi political rights in Tamazga. The struggle for Amazi rights and to be recognized on our own land will continue until, as our name implies, we can truly be free people. One contentious and little known fragment I love about Dia holds that she studied desert birds. A possible burial site of the seer queen shows evidence of the birds. There is claim that her work in this area advanced the early study of winged and wild desert animals. Creatures who migrated through the same lands her people had known and navigated for generations and who, like her, had to rely on messages in the wind to make decisions about when to attempt dangerous crossings. We're learning more about how little we actually know about birds and what they know all the time. Veery birds, small thrushes, are better at predicting hurricane season than contemporary meteorologists. Desert birds have to be wise and far-seeing and adaptive to the wild edges of a hostile habitat and they are at the front lines of system collapse as the surface water burns away and the stretches of sand get too wide to cross. Everywhere the fabric is thinning. We are stretching too far. The center cannot hold. But buried in the sand and the stacks of conflicting colonizer histories, there are icons for our healing and resistance. There are women who led by listening to birds. There are witches who stand like ancient monoliths in the desert, symbolizing lakes that could return. Like so many of the people whose stories we've told on this podcast, what we can see of Dia's real life is like looking through a glass darkly, or through a scrapbook pasted together to serve other people's desires. But the magic for me is that we know her at all. She still scares colonizers and gives her people hope. Murdered and used for centuries, we still say her name. Our lives are seeds, and even when we go back into the electric, pulsing, howling earth, we cannot and will not be erased. I want you to whisper her name to yourself and carry it with you. Dia al Kahina, Dia the Witch, Dia the Gazelle. She is an icon for all those who would resist encroaching darkness to stand with the desert birds for freedom, and she ties our work and what is needful in our labor to the labor of the Amazi people and to the lives and loves and heroisms and traumas of black women. And she offers the wings of this truth. The stories others may have about you do not touch your fundamental power. You are a wave of light and sound. You are unbound. Since we don't have her own words to end with here, here's Algerian icon of post-colonial theory and word witch himself, Franz Fanon, offering you a spell from the love of his own self and his own skin. I am black. I am in total fusion with the world, in sympathetic affinity with the earth, losing my id in the heart of the cosmos. And the white man, however intelligent he may be, is incapable of understanding Louis Armstrong or songs from the Congo. I am black, not because of a curse, but because my skin has been able to capture all the cosmic effluvia. I am truly a drop of sun under the earth. You are truly a drop of sun under the earth. You must be a witch. This episode of the Missing Witches podcast was written and performed by Risa Dickens. Music and editing by Amy Torak. Thanks again to our sponsor, Foxglove Farm. Don't forget to use our listener offer code MISSINGWITCHES for 13% off your order. Or make a contribution to their wildlife rescue out of the woods. Find your witchy wellness at Foxglove Farm. That's farm like pharmacy with a ph dot com. You can also support Missing Witches on Patreon at patreon.com slash missingwitches. And coming soon, Missing Witches t-shirts on TeePublic. And please... We would love it if you would consider pre-ordering our upcoming book, Missing Witches, by Risa Dickens and Amy Torak, published by North Atlantic Books.